This week on the show, we have Dragonfly BSD's kernel optimizations, uh, differences between OpenBSD and Linux, NetBSD's 2019 Google Summer of Code project list. We're also looking at reducing that contention a little bit in OpenBSD. Uh, we have an AFI, AFI a couple of more uh, open source games. Uh, the VMCTL saw some CLI syntax changes that we're covering, and there are things that Linux distributions should not do when packaging in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 302. Contention Reduction, recorded on the 12th of June, 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Treuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. And we're back right into your ears with this fresh episode of BSD Now, having the headlines this week with Dragonfly BSD's kernel optimizations are paying off. Yes, uh, so Dragonfly BSD lead developer Matthew Dillon has been working on a big VM, uh, virtual memory, rework in the name of performance and other kernel improvements in Dragonfly. Uh, here's a look at what those Dragonfly 5.5 development improvements are paying off when compared to 5.4, as well as FreeBSD 12 and five different Linux distributions. Uh, Dylan is using an AMD Ryzen Threadripper system, uh, so they use that too uh, to give those performance changes the best platform. Okay, that should be interesting. Yeah, uh, so looking at uh, the OpenMP CFD solver, that's the benchmark? Apparently it doesn't run on FreeBSD. Oh, uh, the default Clang compiler uh, doesn't want to build, apparently. Uh, but Dragonfly saw a relatively large improvement going from taking 72.5 seconds to less than 55 seconds, although most of the Linuxes were in the 10-second range. Okay. The margins? Uh Looking at the Go benchmark, doing the JSON test, uh, this is nanoseconds per operation, which seems like a weird metric because it takes millions of nanoseconds. Uh, the Dragonfly 5.4.3 took 5.6 seconds, FreeBSD 12, 4.2, and the new Dragonfly with the improvements, only 2.8. And your average uh, Linux was in about the 2.5 range. Uh, doing the test build, uh, rather than the previous test was playing with JSON, uh, Dragonfly, again, nanoseconds per build when it's like a very large number is kind of a useless metric. Difficult to get how big the large, or the large numbers are. Yes. Uh, so Dragonfly took 29.6 seconds before and only 27 seconds after. Uh, Whereas FreeBSD 12 came in just ahead of Red Hat 8 uh, and just behind uh, Debian and Ubuntu. Although apparently Debian 9.9 .9, uh, was quite a bit faster, but no explanation. Although that might be a change of compiler. Or something. I guess it's Go, so maybe it's not a compiler. I don't know. So what's interesting to me is that uh, the N is different for uh, the runs for different systems. So, for example, Dragonfly has n equals 15. Right. I think this is, um, they ran the Dragonfly test 15 times, and that's the average, whereas the Linux ones, they only ran three of each. And you can see on the Dragonfly one, the error bar is quite large because the number varied a lot across those 15 runs, whereas the Linux is all three times they came up with about the same number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's uh, for the people who are conducting experiments. Uh, the usual numbers that they want to see. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because, you know, Foronix doesn't have a great reputation for being very uh, thorough with it, but they definitely had the, uh, more test results. Well, they were setting out to test Dragonfly, so they ran it on Dragonfly a lot more times than they ran on the comparison systems, which makes sense. Okay, so we'll uh, <laughs> leave that aside for now. But yes, the, the one test having the very large error bar is kind of interesting. But yes, it's too bad that the Go benchmarks give their output in unusable units. <laughs> yeah, or they should have formatted it a little bit with uh, decimal points or something. Right, well, they should have factored it out of uh, millions and billions of nanoseconds into, you know, seconds or milliseconds or something. 
Mm. <laughs> That's more human readable. Yeah. Uh, then looking at the X265 benchmark, the uh, uh, the newer Dragonfly stuff actually seems to have reduced the frames per second slightly from 32 to 27. Uh, and possibly because of something wrong with the way they did the benchmarks, FreeBSD 12 is way out ahead of all the Linuxes, which are in about the 33, 34 range, uh, with 45.8 frames per second. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, same thing uh, looking at Graphic Magic, uh, doing a rotate operation. In this one, Dragonfly 5.5 gets slightly faster, going from 208 to 217. Most of the Linuxes are in the 240 something range. Uh, the best one being Red Hat 8 getting up to 266, but again, FreeBSD did 280. Although it's interesting, again, you can kind of see it in the graph. They use different compile flags on each different platform, um, which is both fair and unfair. Um, what they're benchmarking is what you get by default on those OSs, and so they have different compile flags. Um, but not necessarily what exactly the same compile flags would generate on each of those OSs. Which I admit is a different question, right? Uh, the question of, you know, how fast is graphic magic when you install the binary package versus how fast is, you know, FreeBSD at exactly the same workload or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, so that makes it a fair playground. Uh, well, it's just you have to make sure you're answering the same question you're asking. Like looking at the timed... Uh, PHP compilation test. Uh, every one of these platforms is using GCC except for FreeBSD. So the FreeBSD number maybe doesn't actually have the same meaning. Um, and when there's a wild difference here, it's probably because CentOS 7 uses a, a different version of GCC, likely an older, simpler one, than, say, Ubuntu 1904 uses. Oh, yes. Yeah. All that plays a, a part in that uh, number. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a fair comparison, but at the same time, you know, it's the version of GCC that comes with CentOS 7. So if the workload you care about is compiling PHP, then using CentOS 8 uh, will be slower than using CentOS 7. But, you know, you don't compile PHP every day. <laughs> and it only takes 10 seconds longer. And there's probably enough advantages of using uh, CentOS 8 over CentOS 7. Node.js benchmarks, Dragonfly goes from slower than FreeBSD to slightly faster. Although the error bar uh, extends to slightly slower too. So the interesting thing seems to be that the newer uh, Dragonfly 5.5 results are highly variable, but that's likely to do with the, how the NUMA ends up working out for it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah where the uh, caches are placed. If you just get lucky on where you land with the uh, different tests. And still, this is the, the Dragonfly 5.5 development version. It's not released yet. Right, exactly. Uh, but yeah, uh, looks like Dragonfly is doing a bunch of interesting work on the VM subsystem to better support things like the uh, Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX, uh, which is the 32-core slash 64-thread machine. And with more things like that starting to come out, you know, looking at what the, the Ryzen 3990 or whatever, which is going to be 16 cores for a regular price desktop, that's getting pretty interesting. Yeah, as more uh, people are getting access to those machines and running benchmarks or their usual workloads on it, we'll see probably more of those or comparisons. Okay, speaking of comparisons, um, we have an article here. What are the differences between OpenBSD and Linux? So usually people ask what's the difference between BSD and Linux, but this is a specific BSD, OpenBSD in this case. And the author... Uh, starts with the usual question or with the sentence that maybe you have been reading recently about the release of OpenBSD 6.5 and wonder what are the differences between Linux and OpenBSD. So he's been there at some point in the past and these are his conclusions. Uh, they also apply to some extent to other BSDs. However, an important disclaimer applies to this article. So the disclaimer is uh, basically uh, based on his uh, own uh, point of view and his experiences so far. And the, it's the, um, the article is divided into different sections. Um, the first one is a terminal is a terminal is a terminal. And uh, it talks about um, the first thing that you realize is that on the surface, the changes are minimal. Both are Unix-like. You get a terminal, X-Windows, Firefox, LibreOffice, you name it. 
uh, most free software can be recompiled, though some proprietary software isn't on OpenBSD. So don't expect any visual changes. Indeed, the differences between KDE and GNOME on Linux is bigger than the difference between KDE on Linux and KDE on OpenBSD. Yeah, that's definitely something that uh, some Linux people who are BSD curious don't realize is that you know I can I can make you a free BSD machine that you would have a hard time telling wasn't your Linux machine before you you know other than running like uname or you know that time you tried to go to slash proc or slash sys and it wasn't there uh, but aside from there you know you'd run the same apps for your browser and your email and your desktop and so on and you start the same terminal program and you'd run mostly the same commands you know sort has a slightly nicer syntax on freebsd than linux but other than that you're not likely to notice that many differences right off the bat yeah the first steps are typically entering ls into a terminal i guess and that's very similar and so um yeah the flags are slightly different but they're mostly compatible so that you know unless you're using something really exotic you're not going to notice now, you might notice some differences because the distro you were using had aliased ls to default to having certain flags or something. And so then it will feel different. But if you're used to just plain tooling, it's actually not going to be that different. And interestingly, you know, uh, I, I imagine they have it for uh, OpenBSD as well. But uh, when playing with some of the ZFS stuff, uh, there's a core utils package you can install which is similar to the core utils package that's pre-installed in most Linux distros, that will actually provide the GNU versions of, you know, LS and a bunch of other tools if you, for some reason, needed that version for a script or something. Because hmm. uh, I was looking at uh, parts of the ZFS test suite assume the command will be called md5sum rather than just md5, which is what the command is called on FreeBSD. Um, and I haven't looked at it yet, whether it, if the command line arguments that it uses are similar enough and the assumptions are similar enough that we can just use uh, basically just say, hey, if you want MD5, run MD5 instead of MD5sum, or if we should actually make the test suite install the core utils package and use GMD5sum, which is the GNU version. And yeah, in the list under the hood, there are some big differences with relatively little practical impact. So there's the BSD licensing versus the GNU licensing for people who are uh, sensitive about that. Um, there's the whole OS model where some base packages are treated as first class citizens with the kernel versus the bare kernel plus everything is third party. Uh, there's documentation uh, considered as important as code versus good luck with Stack Overflow and reading mailing lists. Uh, and wherever a decision has to be made, security and correctness is prioritized in OpenBSD versus general purpose and popularity and efficiency. And then they talk about more about practical differences. So um, in the OpenBSD case, the base system prefers different default daemons, servers slash defaults than Linux. So for example, um, Apache Nginx is HTTPD, Postfix or SendMail is open SMTPD, uh, NTP is open and NTPD, of course, and Bash is the corn shell. Then they have a section about security and system administration. Of course, security is OpenBSD's big win in this comparison. So they have a whole lot of uh, things listed here that they can score in the security area. Write exclusive X, uh, IPsec, ASLR, kernel relinking, RedGuard, Pledge, Unveil, and much, much more. So some of these OpenBSD innovations uh, also have trickled down into the rest of the Unixes. Uh, some with come with uh, OpenSSH that are basically the factor, the standard on uh, the Linuxes also. So you install OpenSSH on all your Linux boxes to, to get access to it. And they also have a section on why philosophical differences matter. That's um, different philosophy philosophies in the background, like um, that OpenBSD is not so uh, nice or not so fond of um, Blob software. And um, yeah, some Linux kernel specific software does not work uh, on OpenBSD either, namely Docker, things like that. And then uh, there's a section of, uh, so what? does he choose uh, so all the risk uh, or at the risk of being technically wrong um, the author here writes uh, with the goal of emphasizing with the linux user he'll say yes to the question are you telling me that the positives are intangible and the negatives mean a slower system and less software overall uh, but that's pretty much uh, everyone's uh, own decision at this point so it's just a nice comparison uh, between 
what these different systems have to offer. Yeah, uh, basically they went on to say that um, for certain people, these intangible features uh, about the BSDs uh, draw them to those. And because the system architecture and the philosophy and the ease of administration is so much better that it's worth dealing with, uh, you know, not being able to run the Skype binary you can download from Skype's website for Linux uh, and things like that. And I mean, there's always a learning phase if you switch to a different system or explore a system for the very first time. So there might be some frustrations either way. But I think it's well worth looking into a different system and broadening your Unix horizon. Yeah. Um, sorry, this is a good article kind of from the perspective of someone who's used to Linux and is curious about a BSD. Uh, and is in particular was written to highlight kind of the important changes from the perspective of someone looking back. Uh, rather than being necessarily absolute most important changes from a technical standpoint, right? It's not answering the question, what's technically different between OpenBSD and Linux? It's answering, I use, I'm used to using Linux. If I tried BSD, what things I'm going to find different and which of those are going to matter to me? Mm -hmm. What do I need to uh, expect or what kind of things am I taking more care of than when making yeah. my choice? And it, it mostly comes down to, uh, you know, they kind of the same question they've had, uh, in Linux for a long time, it, getting people to switch is usually a matter of five apps. And the first three of those are all easy, right? We got, we got the web browser and the word processor and, and stuff like that. Um, and the fourth app sometimes is a little harder. It's just a matter of, you know, what are they used to? Is there something that's equivalent as good or whatever? Uh, but that fifth app always tends to be a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, whether that's Docker or, um, you know, a proprietary video editing app or something like that, uh, it often comes down to one particular app that uh, keeps someone on a different operating system. And if you're coming from Linux, those numbers are much closer together than if you're coming from, say, a Mac or Windows and coming to BSD. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. So, you know, depending what your needs are, we encourage you to give it a try and try out uh, a BSD that suits you. All right, it's time for the news roundup this week. Uh, this time we have a little more focus on NetBSD's 2019 Google Summer of Code. So they announced the list of um, the projects that were accepted and they are uh, uh, adapting Triforce AFL for NetBSD kernel fuzzing. So there's another fuzzer called Triforce AFL that is um, to be uh, ported or adapted to work with NetBSD to fuzz that kernel. Then there is a add KNF, uh, the NetBSD style Clang format configuration. That is something that might also be interesting to other uh, projects using Clang, like FreeBSD. Yeah, I know that we've talked about Clang format a number of times. So if somebody gets something that's closer to the FreeBSD style into Clang, it might make our job easier. Uh, then there's another fuzzer uh, project called Enhancing Syscaller Support for NetBSD. So Syscaller has been used on FreeBSD for fuzzing some uh, applications or some um, kernel parts. Well, in particular, system calls. Yeah, and found a couple of things already. So Yeah, that was uh, interesting to see that we had a, a demonstration of it at the Waterloo Hackathon. Uh, and I got to see a bit about how it worked and uh, see a little bit of it because I want to look at if it's possible to start fuzzing some of the ZFS IOCTLs using it. Um, well, it's a bit interesting because, you know, the format is a bit specialized. Yeah, and I, I saw a couple of commits go by uh, that uh, Syscaller was also helpful in finding some stuff in SCTP. So that might be something. Yes, uh, and some UDP ones. I know Bjorn was looking at some V6 stuff. Yeah, so that might be a good project to have for NetBSD as well. And then there's a project uh, implementation of Compat underscore Linux and Compat underscore NetBSD 32 DRM IOCTLs support for NetBSD kernel. So that pro deals with um, Linux compatibility and... Well, it's... Yeah, I think it's um, allowing 32-bit NetBSD apps and Linux compat apps to be able to talk to the video driver interface. Oh yeah, DRM and stuff. Okay, then there is a uh, project incorporation of Argon 2 password hashing algorithms into NetBSD. That one's interesting to me because uh, actually our host at the the Waterloo Hackathon, the 
uh, Ali from the university uh, and I had been talking about this and we've made some changes to improve um, the configurability of the uh, bcrypt hashes on FreeBSD. And we had been talking about uh, argon and scrypt and getting uh, one of those options because the default on Linux and FreeBSD right now is um, SHA-512 crypt. But with all the ASICs and stuff that have gone into things like Bitcoin, um, those are, you know, pretty brute forceable nowadays. Uh, you know, the, the hash rates are uh, pretty damn high. And so we probably want to... Um, so we were talking about switching the default back to Bcrypt, but then we thought, you know, Argon 2 is designed to be um, memory expensive as well, kind of like Scrypt, uh, and it was the winner of the password hashing competition, so it's probably what we should do. So I'm very interested in seeing the outcome of that project on NetBSD, because uh, if it makes it easier to incorporate on FreeBSD, then uh, that's how open source is supposed to work. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, then there is uh, the project porting NetBSD to Hummingboard Pulse because it needs to run NetBSD. Uh, that's another embedded board. And last but not least, there is porting Wine to AMD64 architecture on NetBSD. I've not followed, I've never actually tried to use Wine on FreeBSD before, but I know last time I looked at it, it was only available for 32-bit on FreeBSD. Uh, so that might also be something we'd benefit from if that work's not already done on FreeBSD. So these are the projects that NetBSD announced, and the coding has already started. So the period uh, is from May 27 to August 19. And uh, yeah, good luck to all the students and mentors and uh, successful projects. Uh, so next up, we have a story uh, about OpenBSD uh, from the Grenadil uh, blog. Um, saying the opening keynote back at EuroBSDCon 2016 uh, predicted the f next 10 years of the BSDs. Uh, you know, mostly meant to be a bit funny and kind of exaggerate the, the situation and so on. But uh, among all these funny uh, prognostications, GNN said that by 2026, OpenBSD will have its uh, first full implementation of SMP. Now, it's been three years since that talk, and uh, now that forecast is sounding more and more plausible. So why? Where are we? What can we do? Uh, let's try, dive into the issue. So the current state of affairs, most of the OpenBSD kernel still runs under the single lock called kernel underscore lock. Um, that includes most of the syscalls, most of the interrupt handlers, and most of the fault handlers. Uh, most of them, not all of them, um, anyway, meaning we can... Uh, uh, we have collected and fixed bugs where setting up infrastructure and examples. Now this lock uh, remains the principal uh, responsible for the spin percent you can observe in top. Oh, I did not know they broke that out as a separate percent in top. That's an interesting idea. Uh, so you can see how much time on your CPU is spent just waiting uh, for the lock. Yeah, there's a screenshot here in the show notes or in the article that shows a, a top Right, or I imagine if you run top on OpenBSD, you'll see it. Uh, or maybe it's only there if you expand out the percents per CPU, but probably not. Uh, so anyway, he says, I believe that we have opted for a difficult hike when we decided to start removing this lock from the bottom. As a result, many SCSI and network interrupt handlers, as well as all audio and USB uh, ones, uh, can be executed without this big lock. On the other hand, very few syscalls are already or almost ready uh, to actually be unlocked. This explains why basic primitives like uh, thread sleep, C signal, and cell wake up are only receiving attention now that the top of the network stack is running mostly without the big lock. Uh, you know, OpenVSD has an interesting situation because of their development cycle, where they do uh, release every six months, it means they get basically get a three month period to work. And then a three month period to stabilize, and they have to release, and then they have a three month period to work again. Uh, meaning that it's hard to do uh, a very big chunk of work at once um, because you know you only have three months. Um, whereas you know I, the SMP project on FreeBSD took uh, more than a year and a lot of people working on it, uh, and even then it, it wasn't. It took even longer to stabilize. <laughs> um, so. It's been interesting to watch their approach of kind of working on individual subsystems at a time and trying to sort it all out. So uh, in the past years, most of the effort has been invested into the network stack. Um, 
and it should be ready to be parallelized. However, uh, I think we should now concentrate on removing the kernel lock, even if the code paths aren't performance critical. The question is, uh, you know, will that happen in time for 2026? Mm. I would imagine so. 2026 is still a ways off at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure here. Uh, but this proposes, uh, or poses a dilemma. Uh, taking part of the kernel out of the big lock doesn't actually improve performance. Uh, on the short term, it might even decrease performance depending on the mechanisms that we use to replace it. On the other hand, it will improve the overall latency of the system. Uh, for example, uh, a user, Ratchetov, uh, recently figured out that due to the big lock, Firefox might prevent USB transfers from being completed. Uh, because Firefox would end up holding a lock and stopping the USB thing from happening or whatever. That does sound a bit crazy. Uh, the performance dilemma and our egos led us to believe we could go uh, lock-free from the start. We tried to pull the steps of breaking the big lock into smaller locks, at least in the network stack. It worked well enough until we reached the insertion of an ARP entry. I'm sure this approach can work, but I doubt it'll be the easiest or the fastest. So looking at splitting it, uh, you can split things up into basic blocks. Uh, so T-Sleep and friends are looking for some love and order to guarantee that no wake-up is lost without the big lock. Uh, the Futex wait operation, as well as the VFS uh, set lock and uh, purge locks, are two places that could uh, benefit directly from this type of change. Whereas cell wake-up and C-signal are two beasts that generate a lot of uh, workarounds while unlocking the network stack. Recently, we found uh, two new problems uh, related to the fact that they still need the big lock. Dealing with these um, selective wake-up should be relatively easy, but C-Signal invokes uh, playing with many other data structures. Uh, and he says, in my opinion, it's a great starting point for splitting the work that was being started on the proc tree lock. And then they talk about a bunch of other different areas, including the pipe system call, uh, read and write, uh, the USB stack, VFS, etc. And then, obviously, fault handlers. <laughs> uh, so, the ideas presented above are just examples of what could be done. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many other possibilities. In my opinion, it's uh, best to get started with small changes, but it's up to the one that actually does the work. Every function out of the kernel lock helps, uh, so how do we get started? That's the question or the big deal. Uh, especially, you know, when you only have a short window to do your changes and make sure it all works and get the system back to working if there's a problem before the next release. Yeah, that's important. And uh, they will uh, get there eventually. And uh, in the meantime, we'll watch their progress. So next, we have something for the gamers among us. And we mentioned this in a previous episode a couple of weeks ago. Uh, FNAFI FI 1.3 has been released, which means more games are FNAFI FI and run. So just here we go. Uh, that's over at Reddit. And the release mentions that they finally address some of the problems that prevent simple running of several games. Uh, this happens, for example, when an old FNA.dll library comes with the games that don't uh, match the API of their native libraries like the SDL2 or Open, OpenAL or even Mojo Shader anymore. So some of those cases can be fixed by simply dropping in a newer FNA.dll and then FNA and IFI asks for if the FNA 17.12 should be automatically added if a known incompatible FNA version is found. And then you can simply answer yes or no. And this generally fixes the following games. So Apotheon, it runs, but still a little buggy. Then Curse of the Crescent Isle, DX. Have you heard any of those games before, Alan? Seems new to me. Not many of these games. <laughs> Although there's one called Escape Goat that has a <laughs> sequel called Escape Goat 2. <laughs> and suddenly I want to try this. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, a big list here. Um, yeah, some of these sound like um, kind of, what do you call it? Um, like indie games or something. Probably, yeah. Skulls of the Shogun. Yeah, it's a big list of extra games to try out on your favorite BSD. Mm -hmm. And they provide a couple of instructions to uh, try it out yourself. 
Ah, and they also have a second link at the bottom here to the OpenBSD shopping guide, <laughs> uh, which lets you know if a commercial game that you are interested in will actually run on OpenBSD. Yeah, so it seems like gaming is getting better on BSD. And uh, yeah, people should try it out and report back or help with testing even. So then all other people can enjoy a little bit of gaming here and there. Yeah, they have uh, quite a list here, so. Uh, what you should also check out is uh, VMCTL. Uh, the command line syntax has changed, so be aware that um, there's a bit of change that might affect you. Yeah, so I guess this is the, um, I guess this is the OpenBSD equivalent of the updating file in FreeBSD. So it's a, a rolling web page telling you about changes in dash current that might impact you if you are trying to run it. Uh, so they have one here from the uh, end of. Uh, saying that in order, the, sorry, the order of the arguments in the create, start, and stop commands of VMCTL, which is used to start and stop VMs, uh, has been changed to match a commonly expected style. The manual usage or scripting with VMCTL must be aligned to use the new syntax, uh, which is now VMCTL uh, create, then the flags, like dash s 50g, and then the file name, rather than putting the flags at the end. So by default, the get ops in BSDs expect all the flags and then the non-flag arguments at the end, whereas one on Linux can allow them to be kind of intermingled. But yes, this fixes it to be the way you would expect uh, and looks more like the ZFS command line. Yep, that's familiar to people. Yep, uh, there's also uh, some other notes in here that we might as well cover since we're here. The Acme client uh, has an update here. Um, it's been implement, updated to implement the uh, RFC 8555, uh, which means that users have to change the uh, directory URL in their acmeclient.conf to use the v2 API instead of v1. Uh, there's also an update here about the MariaDB ports. Uh, now that the default version of MariaDB is 10.3, uh, but due to changes in the redo log, ensure that your previous version was shut down cleanly before you upgrade your version of MariaDB. And you might also need to change the inodb additional mempool size. Uh, it's no longer supported, so you want to remove that if it's there. Uh, and if the new version of MariaDB fails to start, you want to look at the uh, hostname.error log, and uh, it will tell you what the problem is. Huh. Uh, and lastly, for Acme Client, the capital A and capital D flags have been removed. The private keys are now created automatically if they're missing. Um, if you were using either of these flags in your regular command lines, then you should remove them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be on the safe side. Um, but yes, so if you were using scripts to run VMCTL or Acme Client, then you need to watch out for these changes. Make sure to check that site often to be on the latest. Uh, and then finally, we have... Uh, a uh, blog post from our, Christ, our friend Chris Seiberman over at the University of Toronto, and he says, something that Linux distribution should not do when packaging things. So he says, right now, I'm a bit unhappy at Fedora for a specific packaging situation. So let me tell you a little story of what I, as a system administrator, would like all these distributions to not do. Uh, for reasons beyond the scope of this blog entry, I run a Prometheus and Grafana setup on both my home and office Fedora Linux machines. Among other things, it gives me a place to test out various things involving Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, when I set this up, I used the official upstream versions of both of these packages because I needed to match what we would be running or would be running soon um, in production. The Grafana people supply Grafana in a variety of package formats. And because Grafana has a bunch of files and paths, I opt to use their RPM package instead of their charball. The Grafana people uh, gave their RPM package the package name of Grafana, which is perfectly reasonable for them to do. And you notice that they also use the .dev version for their Ubuntu-based production servers for the same reason. Life is too short to spend patiently setting tons of command line switches or configuration file paths to sell someone where to find all of the bits if the people provide a nice prepackaged artifact. However, recently, Fedora decided to package Grafana themselves as an RPM, and they called their RPM Grafana. Since the two different packages are different versions of the same thing as far as the package manager is concerned, Fedora basically took over the Grafana package name from Grafana. Uh, this caused my system to offer to upgrade me from 
the Grafana.com 6.1.5 package to the Fedora Grafana 6.1.6 package, which I actually did after taking reasonable steps to make sure that the Fedora version was compatible with the file layout and so on from the Grafana version. So far, I have no objection to what Fedora did. They provided the latest version of Grafana, and their new package was a drop-in replacement for the upstream package. The problem is what happened next, which is that the Grafana people released Grafana 6.2 on May 22nd, and currently there's no sign of any update to the Fedora package, uh, with no activity since 6.1.6. At this point, it's unclear to me if Fedora has any plans to upgrade uh, 6.1.6 to 6.2. For example, perhaps they have decided to freeze on this initial version. So why is this a problem? It's simple. If uh, you're going to take over a package name from upstream, you should keep up with the package releases. If you take over a package name and don't keep up to date, or keep up to date only sporadically, you cause all sorts of heartburn for system administrators who use the package. Uh, the least annoying feature of this situation is that Fedora has abandoned Grafana at 6.1.6, and I can just overwrite it with the new upstream 6.2.1, which will hopefully be a transparent replacement and not blow up in my face. Uh, but the most annoying feature is that Fedora and Grafana keep ping-ponging versions back and forth, uh, which will make every one of my DNF upgrades into a minefield, because it will frequently try to give me a Grafana upgrade that I don't want and would actually be dangerous to accept. And of course, the situation turns Fedora up, uh, version updates into their own minefield, since now I risk an upgrade to Fedora 30 actually reverting the Grafana package to an even older version. Uh, you can hardly miss that Grafana already supplies a Grafana RPM. It's right there on their download page. In this situation, I feel the correct thing for a Linux distribution to do is to pick another package name, one that doesn't clash with the upstream established packaging. If you can't stand doing this, uh, don't package the software at all. That's interesting because I'm not sure I have exactly the same feelings about that. In particular, if I'm a user and I want to install Grafana, I'm going to just default to doing package manager install Grafana, and I would like the OS version of Grafana. Uh, I think that kind of like when when the project that creates the software provides their own packages for it, I feel like they should kind of namespace them as their own version of it. Well, in FreeBSD, you have the packages Grafana 2, Grafana 2, 3, 4, 5, and uh, I think 6 also. Right, but if, if Grafana made their own FreeBSD packages that you could download in package add, uh, or if you just added the Grafana repo to your, your package.com, if multi-repo worked a bit better than it does. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like they should have an origin of Grafana slash the version or something, or even just change the package name as like upstream dash Grafana or something so that it wouldn't conflict. Ideally, they would work with the distribution people closely together to make that specific version work well with the pro uh, with the operating system. Yeah, it's just um, at the same time, you know, uh, if you're Grafana, you don't want to have to work with every possible Linux distro to make sure that they package your software right. No, of course not. <laughs> uh, and it's you know, and if you're the FreeBSD ports people, you don't want to have to work with every every one of the distributors of the thirty thousand packages we make uh, to make sure that you're not stepping on their package name. Uh, you know, maybe it's a bit different in FreeBSD, where I think the whole package namespace is owned by FreeBSD, uh, and so if you make a custom package, then it's kind of your job to namespace it off. Um, but yes, I do feel like there would be an there should be a nice way to solve this problem. Uh, I just I think the answer is actually the opposite of what Chris is proposing here. I think maybe actually what they should do is uh, Grafana should be called vendor dash Grafana, something like that, so that they know that this is upstream. Uh, and then you know vendor dash Prometheus etc. So that it's clear that this is the upstream one from the vendor who makes Grafana, rather than this is the one that comes from the OS. Yeah. Otherwise, you do have to grab the tarballs and compile it all yourself, and you want to actually have the package because it's done for you. Right, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. But yeah, I think maybe the right answer here is to if you make your own packages, uh, they should be called vendor dash uh, the thing, and that way it's easy to tell that oh, we're using the raw version from upstream here 
rather than the version package specifically for our OS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then people can trust that this is actually the one they find on their website. Yeah, and you need to still make it uh, have the conflict entry because you probably don't want to have both installed either. <laughs> yeah, no, no package clashes there. That would be bad, usually. Okay, now it's time for our Beastie Bits this week. We have something interesting. Uh, there's a talk uh, on uh, the nice bucket list about ZFS versus UFS on APU2 MSATA SSD with FreeBSD. So that's a recording. Hmm, I wonder if he's specifically talking about the, the APUs that I know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> I know where two of his APUs are. And I'm wondering if he's talking about those ones or different ones. Anyway. Uh, George says, I generally run OpenBSD on my swarm of APU2s, but I'm going to try running FreeBSD 12. I tended to shy away from ZFS since I'm not a large data mode, uh, and with a single disk in this case, there's really no huge benefit. Well, we'll argue about that part in a second. <laughs> but he says, I decided to go with ZFS on this MSATA on the Evo Sony with Gelly encryption. Uh, does it make sense? Does anyone else have experience with ZFS versus UFS on the APU2 specifically. Uh, so there definitely are some benefits to ZFS even on single disk installs, including the boot environments concept, especially uh, if it's an APU hosted remotely somewhere else. Uh, also, I have a patch that might be super helpful to you if you're doing Gelly encryption with an APU2 that makes the Gelly password prompt go to the serial port. Yep. Uh, it can't be turned on by default because if machines don't have a serial port, it can cause the bootloader to hang and not actually boot as it waits for the serial port to initialize. Um, but there definitely is the ability to make that password prompt show up on the serial port, uh, which I know with uh, two of the APUs that are cross-connected with serial, uh, you can reboot one by connecting to the serial console from the other to enter the password. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ike replies and says, uh, but he says, but there are benefits depending, uh, such as not having to do FSCK if uh, the machine hard resets, the block level checksumming, uh, which helps with metadata even if it's not a, a multi disk pool. Plus, you can do copies equals if you have important data or whatever. The snapshots and user features, uh, the idea of having all of the space available to any one of your file systems rather than having to partition the disk up. Uh, the ZFS snapshots with replication, meaning it's easy to uh, back up the things to either the other APU near it or far away and so on. Yeah, so <laughs> the list is long and the features are too compelling to miss, even on a single disk pool. Yeah, as long as the APUs have a 64-bit uh, memory space, uh, even if they don't have a lot of memory, it should work fine. Okay, but I guess the discussion there is uh, already ongoing and they are uh, encouraging him to try it out. Yes, I'm going to need to reach out. <laughs> I guess so. To George and uh, provide my extra tips. Someone's wrong on the internet, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, it's not wrong. It's just I have, I have special things that will make his life easier. <laughs> okay, yeah, then definitely do that. Okay, then uh, as a nice connection to a previous episode, uh, NetBSD 8.1 is finally out. So that's the release version, not the release candidate anymore. And um, pretty much uh, nothing big has changed since last time we covered it. So there is um, the highlights uh, that we already listed, the mitigations for the Intel uh, memory leaks, and the... Uh, Various network driver fixes and improvements, fixes for thread local storage, TLS and position independent executable, as well as uh, DRM KMS improvements and some driver updates. And yes, um, if you want to see NetBSD pull out uh, more and more releases in the future, then consider making a donation to the NetBSD Foundation and um, that supports the project. And next we have a post by uh, or about Lazy Boy with OI. Uh, which is the laziest possible way to send raw HTTP post data. Uh, over at GitHub, we found this. And uh, it's a script, a bash script actually, which makes it fast and easy to send raw HTTP post requests to servers, for example, to send some JSON to an API endpoint that you are developing on your machine, or to, some, or to send some test data to an API that you are integrating with. And it's using curl. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. 
Yep, so there's an uh, example embedded HTTP request listed there, and the usage is basically lazy boy uh, destination and then optionally the port, and there it's uh, options uh, dash v and dash h, which give you the version and uh, help respectively. And which tool is it actually using to send the request? Uh, they mentioned curl in their description. Oh, nc. Uh, it's for it is netcat. Or, yeah, Netcat. Mm -hmm. Which is the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, readily available on most Unix systems. Now, this next one is pretty interesting. The Markov keyboard, uh, which is a keyboard that whose layout changes based on the Markov frequency of your typing. Uh, so I guess you run this program and you keep typing. And then based on what you type, it rearranges your keyboard to be most efficient, I guess. Mm hmm so less traveling time for the for the fingers would certainly be interesting to try this out but i guess it takes some time to adjust to your typing uh frequency and also language specific typing is different so currently it only remaps the letters a through z uh and this is how do you make it go and this is use a pre-trained uh, markov uh, emacs script here and then load the file uh and then set your input method and choose the Markov Insanity A as your type. Um, it currently has 26 different key maps you can choose from. Uh, you can also download a plain file for training the Markov chain by running the Python script crunch frequencies on a file name that you've, of a, I guess, a representative sample of your writing. Uh, <laughs> and so, how do you make it stop? Control backslash uh, to. Uh, toggle the input method to back to stock Emacs. Yeah, so the only constant in this key rearrangement is the space bar, which will always stay the same, at the same position. <laughs> um, well, I think it, it currently doesn't remap the number keys either. Yeah, okay. So you can at least still type the numbers as they are in order. But I can see cases where some of the symbols would move to a letter that you don't use very often so that you wouldn't have to hit shift to to get like the the star and the ampersand. Oh, yes, or if you type lead speak a lot <laughs> for for passwords or something. <laughs> it would certainly be be interesting to look at this. <laughs> Pretty silly. And back to our theming from earlier about gaming, uh we also have the osgameclones.com uh which is rather than trying to get commercial games to work on your favorite BSD or whatever, uh, is games that have actually been rewritten open source. Uh, some of these games uh, fall in different categories. A remake, uh, which is where the executable and sometimes the assets uh, have been remade open source, meaning you don't necessarily need any of the original game. Um, or maybe they've modified the game a little bit and it's just a spiritual remake or whatever. A clone is a game that's very similar or heavily inspired by the original game. Uh, similar is just a game that's kind of similar. Uh, or a tool is not a game, but something that assists with playing or modding the game. I know uh, some of the open source clones I've played depend on reusing the art assets from the original game. So they're more about taking this old DOS game and being able to play it on your modern computer. Yeah, with higher resolutions and uh, some other uh, cool things. Yeah, so you find your favorite game, uh, Example in the beginning here is Ace Combat Assault Horizon, uh, which has been remade as Open Horizon. Or Age of Empires has a number of remakes, including Zero AD, which is playable, uh, Chariot, which is currently unplayable, Open Age, which is new, and but only semi-playable, uh, and so on. Uh, I also found on this one um, Need for Speed uh, 3 having been recreated as Open NFS, uh oh of course which is a confusing name but <laughs> civilization is also there because some of these have also been open sourced by their original uh game studios and then people can mod away yeah i don't think i have a category for for those particular cases yeah at the top there's a filter by language or by genre yeah but i don't think there's one specifically for this is the original game that's now open source ah yes um because uh, the the biggest problem with that is that you have um, you know the original game will be for the original operating system, which means it probably take quite a bit of work to get it to be useful on a modern operating system. Mm. 
Yep. Uh, the list is long. They have civilization. Do they have colonization? I remember there used to be a clone called Free Call. Yes, what happened to that one? doesn't appear to be on this list here, but it might be dead. Uh, some of these are specifically marked that it's uh, there was an open source project, but it's dead now because nobody's working on it. Hmm, too bad. Or XCOM or some of these older shooters. Apparently somebody's written the original uh, Command and Conquer as an HTML5 game, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Ah, and then there's one a clone called Open Sage, which is apparently an attempt to remake Command and Conquer Generals. Oh, if that's playable. I would play that. Is that also network capable? I mean, with multiple people. I don't know. I I ended up paying a second time for the game to get the version that would run on Windows Seven back in the day. <laughs> yeah, the the endless gaming hours. But it's unclear the Open Sage uh, website here mostly points to a bunch of posts about parsing the uh, replay files. Oh, they're still in the planning phase or in the uh, early setup? Uh, well, no, they have their first release, but no news since then, which was at the beginning of 2018, which is slightly depressing now. Yeah. But lots of games here. There's plenty for people to choose from. Ooh, somebody's done Company of Heroes. <laughs> I'm looking at Open XCOM, so <laughs> that game still works, though. So my copy of Company of Heroes still works on Steam, so <laughs> I don't need a replacement right now. But yeah, with with Gawk and all. Oh, yes, here it is. Sid Meier's Colonization has uh, Free Call. When was the last release? Uh, 2015. Uh, what if it worked? But at least the list is a good starting point for jumping into these individual projects. Uh, I don't know. The, the one I've definitely got the most value out of was um, Open TTD, uh, Transport Tycoon Deluxe. Oh, yes. The train networks. Uh, I remember originally, it started as some patches on top of the original game to extend it to be able to have like longer trains and such. Uh, but then Open TTD basically rewrote it, and it's uh, like 120% playable. Uh, it's super great and added multiplayer, and I, I played way too much of it. <laughs> Spent lots of time making interesting train interchanges and so on. <laughs> yeah, not making them crash into each other. Complicated switching. Yes. If you want to make, we want to learn about locking. That's where you start. That's certainly interesting. Just train signals. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. But I was just starting to think about, you know, could you actually conceptualize some of the different lock types using train system into a train oh talk to george about that he will certainly certainly be because like <laughs> if you have like a spin lock would it be a bunch of the trains driving in a circle waiting until their chance to keep going and stuff get out <laughs> yeah that that could be all kinds of interesting but yeah uh, last but not least actually coming back to our beastie bits is that the euro BSDCon program and the registration is open and available over at eurobsdcon.org you can find everything that you need if you want to have a look at the program and the registration information is all there. So they have uh, tutorials and uh, talk. Yes, registration is open now. Um, you should sign up. Um, there's some interesting tutorials to look at on the, uh, the first days, including an introduction to hardware hacking with FreeBSD, which will be hands-on and very fun, led by Tom Jones. There's also the network management with the OpenBSD packet filter tool set. Um, Poudre for port maintenance by Matthew Seaman. Uh, and building a container infrastructure with FreeBSD jails and Ansible by Albert Deng. Uh, on the second day will be the full day tutorials, including the full day of an introduction to the FreeBSD open source operating system by Kirk McCusick and managing Unix systems with Ansible by JP Menz. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that should be interesting. Watch out, don't crash. <laughs> That's in case JP Menz is listening to us while driving again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he tweeted the other day that uh, he was listening to the podcast driving along and was very surprised to hear his name. And he's not the first person to have said that to me. We're, we're yeah, coming to you when least expected out of your uh, audio boxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one was somebody who, oh, it was uh, Christoph. I, I was saying goodbye to him in Japan. Uh, one or two years ago, um, and so I was like, I was leaving him at the train station to go take his train somewhere, uh, and then he realized that 
he was going to go sit on this train and start listening to the podcast. <laughs> and they'd immediately be hearing my voice again. <laughs> Here we go again. It's like, yeah, I'll see you next time. He's like, well, I'll hear you in like five minutes. <laughs> For us, it's a bit difficult. Uh, we have a little longer uh, time to see people or hear them. Yep. Uh, so uh, we'll start with a keynote on the, I guess it's the Friday. Uh, and then we'll have a whole bunch of talks, including Paul Vixie talks about DNS over HTTPS. Uh, Paul Goyette, who we interviewed a number of years ago, uh, talks about improving the modularity of NetBSD's compat code. Uh, Brooks Davis is talking about the Cherry ABI. Uh, Misha Peters will talk about using the OpenBSD hypervisor in the wild. Um, Mesej Groshyaksi, <laughs> sorry, butchered that name. Uh, we'll talk about fuzzing file systems using NetBSD and the AFL fuzzer and KCOV. Uh, Cornell Delube, I uh, will talk about implementing TPM version 2 and SGX on FreeBSD uh, for improving security. Uh, Rake Floiter will talk about modernizing RelayD and HTTPD for uh, HTTP 2. Andrew Turner will talk about fuzzing the FreeBSD kernel using syscaller uh, and KCOV and so on. Michael Shu will talk about uh, Beehive Guest with accelerated graphics. I'm sure that won't be well attended. Um, Stephen Sperling will talk about Game of Trees. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say much more about what that is. Well, people can look at the descriptions and be surprised. Right. Well, there was, there was more information in the program committee to help us decide about the talk. But anyway, uh, one I'm looking forward to is Warner Losh is doing 7th edition Unix 40 years later. Uh, and Dan will be talking about why he prefers thick jails over thin jails. Uh, which is basically avoiding base jail concept now, which is also something I'm looking at switching uh, how we do things at Scale Engine as well. Then Alexander Bloom will talk about uh, visualization of regression and performance, uh, and George Neville Neal will talk about porting NPF to FreeBSD and how it performs. Yeah, that would be interesting. I didn't know he was working on that. Yeah, neither did I. Um, currently on the schedule, the Second keynote is at the end of the first day, but we're thinking of moving it to the beginning of the first day and rearranging things slightly. But on the second day, we'll have uh, adding VMM to Packer uh, for OpenBSD with Philip Bueller. Uh, Arun Thomas will talk about Rust. System programmers can have nice things. Uh, Slava Schwartzman will talk about uh, kernel TLS and TLS hardware offload. Um, Patrick Wilt will talk about uh, wireless fidelity with the BWFM. Um, Dan Langill will talk about ZFS for newbies. Uh, Drew Gallatin will talk about his NUMA optimizations uh, for the FreeBSD networking stack. That's impressive work. Uh, Mark Espy will talk about advanced port toolkits, the nearly perfect packing list generation for OpenBSD ports. Uh, definitely some interesting things for people doing porting on all the operating systems there. I'll be giving an updated version of my future of OpenZFS and FreeBSD, uh, which hopefully will not resemble that much the one in, we gave at PSDCAN, but will actually have a lot of new information. There's progress. Yeah. Uh, Dave Cottlehuber will talk about sharing and rotating credentials in a hostile environment, uh, which means you know one of the talks I most want to see will be at the same time as mine. But that's, you know, situation normal over here. <laughs> Recordings. Uh, <clears throat> after much prodding, Colin Percival will give his 23 years of software side channel attacks overview. Uh, Emmanuel Vidot will talk about packaging base on FreeBSD and uh, are we there yet? Um, Pablo Carboni will talk about Unbound and FreeBSD, a true love story. And finally, uh, Eric Overby will do uh, FreeBSD on the absurdities of security compliance. Huh, okay. So, hopefully a lot of those sound interesting to you, uh, and you can uh, register and see you in Norway. All right, it's feedback and questions time. Remember, if you don't submit us any questions, then this section will be very, very short. And we don't want to have that. So send us anything that you have, comments, show ideas, topics, the question you were always uh, waiting to ask to feedback at bsdnow.tv, and then it will show up in a future episode. 
Uh, the first one this week is John with a segment idea. Goes like this. Uh, you've mentioned previously, but repetition, uh, I don't think will bore our audience. Uh, rep uh, so description of our daily driver, mobile and or stationary hardware, OS version and update train, uh, desktop environment, developer environment and workflow. Okay, that one could take a while because I have quite a few different environments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I have my everyday FreeBSD workstation, my FreeBSD conference laptop, uh, my basically my home NAS slash development server, uh, and then actually the machine I'm sitting at to do this podcast here. But yeah, uh, we should look at something like that. I think uh, that'll be spread out over a number of episodes because there's so much to cover. Yeah, maybe we could keep that segment static on a website somehow and then only change it if there isn't a change. Uh, meh. <laughs> Somewhere out there. Some of these things are... You can just do it again when you get your new machine. Yes, definitely. That's the next uh, big investment I will do. But what we have to importantly do is get the inventory of your current machine done first. Oh yeah, sure. And I also see a couple of things happening at my uh, cluster at work. Um, so there's a couple of new machines uh, planned to be bought. And of course, this will be a good test bed for FreeBSD. Um, yeah, as, but as, as Alan said, a new laptop is definitely due. Mine is from end of 2013. Uh, still running, still working fine, but uh, eventually it will die. I don't know that I would consider your battery life to be working fine. <laughs> no, I get warnings of like every two hours. And so, yeah. It's not the nicest way of working anymore, but it's it come this far and it's still used uh, in actually recording this actual audio, and yeah, so far. Um, but as Alan said, there's a lot of stuff to mention. We will uh, come up with something, uh, think about, and then uh, you have our latest driver. What's also interesting to us is what you are using, because you might have a, a different environment or a different. Uh, a use case for the BSDs or for your daily driver. Uh, plus the show production and post-processing tools, that's a whole bi different, uh, bigger uh, keg to open. But you can find some of these stuff at um, our Jupiter Broadcasting um, company or, yeah, our <laughs> sister podcasts. So yeah, thanks for that question and uh, we'll get back to you on that in uh, one way or the other. Uh, the next question comes from Johnny. So the first one was John, and now it's Johnny, not to mix them up. And uh, John is writing, um, oh yeah, audio-only format, please don't, is the title. So it goes like this. Hi guys, it is very sad that you will be going to audio-only format. Please don't do this. The audio is high enough quality, there is no need to do this thing. I watch a show on my Roku every Wednesday or Thursday, and I'm going to the, um, yeah, Oh, to tell you that the other Jupiter Broadcasting shows are just boring. Listen to them without the video being available. Uh, I would very much appreciate that you keep offering the video format, even if it's not edited. Besides, it's a lot harder to explain technical stuff through audio only. Anyway, I'm so sad after hearing this news. Well, I don't know that we do any better job of explaining things, because, you know, I can use my hands a little bit, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, yeah. Um, so, the video, we still do video when we go live, although it's mostly just videos of our faces rather than websites because I finally managed to uh, trash the, the third computer in the production setup, <laughs> so I don't need it anymore. Whoops. Uh, but, um, yeah. Um, so, yes, if you go to bsdnow.tv slash live, you can watch the show live when it's on, but using the Scale Engine DVR feature, you can... Uh, pause and resume that or play back the live show even once it's over yeah a couple of days after even it, it stays up for i think the default is three days right now but i'm working on a script to to make a special override for bsd now so it will stay up until the next episode happens uh, so that you'll always be able to watch the last episode by going to that website that won't help so much on your Roku, probably. But We're sorry that we kind of disappointed you there, but um, we're not completely going away. There's the audio. And yeah, as Alan said, go listen to us or watch us live on Wednesdays um, in case you miss our faces moving around and <laughs> talking to you like in a, in a real video. Okay, and um, last but not least, Alex, uh, with a bit longer message uh, with thanks and some Linux snaps versus PBI feedback. Uh, he writes, Greetings, 
I, as you're always here, Oh, as you always hear from people writing in, of course, love the show and really appreciate everything you do. Thank you for that feedback. Um, also to your feedback, Johnny, in the previous question. Um, it is awesome to get all this information about the BSDs in one place and it's really cool to see some insights as to the BSD communities. Uh, I personally have not been fortunate enough to switch over to any of the BSDs yet and my main difficulty is time to, off, uh, to learning it because I'm already so familiar with Linux. I'm slowly getting myself acquainted, though, with running ZFS on Ubuntu 19.4. Uh, so that way, when I do get more time, and one other thing we'll ask below as um, if this is possible yet, I can transition over with a little bit less to learn. Okay, yeah, there's no no deadline here. You can learn in your own pace. That's, that's not required to be completely uh, switched over in the next year or so. Uh, so first off, one of the reasons why I haven't fully transitioned to one of the BSDs is because I would like to do PCIe pass-through to a Windows VM for gaming every once in a while. Uh, we covered that in previous ep in the previous episode, the possibilities now to use Beehive. Right, but that's not for Windows. Um, so, well, Beehive doesn't do it. Zen does. Zen, yeah. Uh, although I've not personally tried it. Uh, apparently, Zen will be able to do VGA pass-through, and you would be able to do it that way. So that's definitely worth uh, giving it a try. And uh, then, as the title implies, he, uh, he has a few comments about the PCBSD PBI versus Linux snaps. Um, so he found uh, a Stack Exchange link uh, about why the PC, uh, PCBSD PBI was not used anymore. And he was curious whether first, there are all the reasons or are there more? And second, if there seems like most of the reasons why PBI was scrapped, as this article says, was, well, a few reasons, but here are his comments on them. And it lists a couple of um, them. Because uh, I think PBI was not scrapped because it was a bad format. Um, but Chris Moore or the uh, PCBS team ultimately decided to use the packages that are available now or build their own packages. Right. Well, I think part of what happened was, you know, when PBIs were invented, FreeBSD was still doing the old PKG underscore add system, which was not very useful. Compared to now, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't actually know all the reasons PBI was scrapped. I wasn't there for that. Yeah, um, you would have to ask uh, uh, the PCBSD folks or uh, the TrueOS folks nowadays. Um, yeah, there's a little bit more about the Linux Snap ecosystem. That's probably uh, following a similar approach like PBIs did. Right, so uh, to, to explain the, the, the differences at the time, at the time, FreeBSD didn't have a good package manager. It had a crappy package manager and the packages were built once on the release day, and that was it. So, you know, two months after the release, you're getting two-month-old style packages, which is not fun. And so, well, PBI wasn't necessarily meant to replace the package manager. It's just there wasn't a good package manager for it to live alongside of. Uh, I'm not in sure entirely what was involved in converting something to a PBI, but I imagine with the way Pudera works nowadays, you might actually be able to make such a thing using the existing framework and not have to have as much of a, a faff. But part of it is, you know, you have to actually test and make sure the apps work properly, which is something that's difficult to do on 30,000 apps. Yeah, so I guess that's more handleable in the way they do it now. Okay, yeah, so that's uh, our current take. We, we're not uh, too deep into the reasons why, um, but I guess that the current system is better than running the PBI system. Right. Well, like, you know, I, I've thought about different approaches, but the current one works for me, so I've not had to spend much time on it. Yeah, so I guess that is uh, the state of things as they are right now. Uh, yeah, so thanks for uh, sending us that question. Um, he also writes, I look forward to joining you two on the BSD sooner or later. Is that a request for an interview or something? No, it just means he looks forward to actually using BSD eventually. Okay, yeah. Yeah, do that. Um, Take it slow, ask questions as um, many as required, and then slowly get into it. There's really no no rush to uh, get into it. And you will, we'll keep you updated through the show. Make sure to send more questions and feedback to feedback at bsdnow.tv. All right, that's all for this week. Yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, see you next week. Bye.